Okay. What I wanna talk about for basically the rest of the course is what happens when we put together two different powerful ideas. The ideas of orthogonality and dot products, which we spent chapter five talking about, and the ideas of eigenvectors, which we spent chapter seven talking about. So <clears throat> we've seen two different kinds of bases which are very useful to work with. An orthonormal basis is a basis where everything in geometry works the way you think it does. Dot products, angles, lengths, they all work the way you're used to if you have an orthonormal basis. And on the other hand, we've also seen eigenbases. Eigenbases are very good for computing powers of matrices. And we want to see what happens if we put them together. So let's suppose we have a square matrix. And let's suppose that the square matrix has an eigenbasis, which is also orthonormal. So what's this matrix A going to be like? Okay, let Q be the matrix whose columns are the eigenbasis. A lot of the times we've called that matrix S, so I'm gonna call it Q. And let D be the diagonal matrix of diagonal entries lambda one, lambda two, through lambda N. So then we have A equals Q, D, Q inverse. This is the diagonalization formula, which works for any, uh, any eigenbasis. But today we have a special eigenbasis. We have an orthonormal eigenbasis which means the Q is an orthogonal matrix. So Q inverse is the same thing as Q transpose. So if we have an orthonormal eigenbasis, then we have A is Q, D, Q transpose. And where is this gonna show up? One place it's gonna show up immediately is if we take a transpose of this formula. So A transpose, that's Q, D, Q transpose, transpose. So remember when you trans, and then I'm gonna transpose this product. So the way I do that is I take the terms of this product, I write them with transposes in the other order. So this Q shows up over here. This D shows up over here. And this Q transpose shows up over here. So that's the transpose of a product. You get by writing the product in the opposite order with transposes on it. Then Q transpose transpose, that's just Q. And so what we get back is Q D Q transpose, which is the exact same thing we had over here. So we've deduced that A transpose is A. In other words, A is a symmetric matrix. If we have an orthonormal or more eigenbasis, we get a symmetric matrix. And I'll say it again. A matrix with an orthonormal eigenbasis is symmetric. So symmetric matrices come up in lots of places. Here's what you saw in your homework. On your homework, you had a grid of wires and the temperature was different in different parts of the grid. Maybe this was connected to an ice bath and over here we had a furnace. And the heat and inside the machine, heat flowed from one node to another. So if we looked, say at node number two, and we said, what was its temperature at time T plus one? What well, was a linear combination of its temperature at time T and the temperature of its neighbors at time T? Specifically, it was 0.8 times its temperature at time T plus 0.1 times each of the other nodes at time T. So you did a bunch of computations with this matrix in your homework, or perhaps you will do them depending how early you're watching this video. And the thing that I want to point out right now is that this matrix is symmetric. This 0.1 is the same as this 0.1. And the reason that it happens is that the physical meaning of this 0.1 is how fast heat flows from node two to node one. And the physical meaning of this 0.1 is how fast heat flows from node one to node two. And metal doesn't have a preferred direction of heat flow. Heat flows equally well from node one to node two or node two to node one. 
So because the influence of node one on node two is the same as the influence of node two on node one, we get another symmetric matrix. We get, we get a symmetric matrix. Uh, another place where something like this comes up is if you have a physical object with lots of parts that are pulling on each other. So maybe you have the suspension of a car with a bunch of springs on it. And this bolt over here is pulling on this strut over here. Well, by Newton's third law, the strength with which this bolt pulls on this strut is going to be exactly the same as the strength with which this strut pulls on this bolt. And so if you write down a matrix of all of the forces that the different parts of the suspension exert on each other, it's going to be a symmetric matrix because the influence of this part on this part is exactly the same as the influence of this part on this part. And so any place we have a physical system or, or an economic system or um, whatever, where the influence of part one on part two is the same as the influence of part two on part one, you probably have a symmetric matrix hiding somewhere. Okay. So what we've said so far is that, is that if your matrix has an orthonormal eigenbasis, then your matrix is symmetric. And the big theorem is that the reverse is also true. If A is a symmetric matrix, then it has an orthonormal eigenbasis. We'll prove that later. For now, let's talk about some ways to think about it. So the easy part of this is that if A has an eigenbasis, then that eigenbasis will be orthonormal. So let's see why it is that if we have a symmetric matrix and that matrix has an eigenbasis, then it has an orthonormal eigenbasis. And the question of why it has an eigenbasis at all is harder. Okay, so to start off with, let's say we have a symmetric matrix A and we have two vectors V and W and I'm going to compute V transpose AW. In other words, the dot product of V with AW. Remember, whenever you see a vector transpose times another vector, that's a dot product. That's V dot AW. Well, since A is symmetric, I can replace A with A transpose, and then V transpose A transpose, that's AV transpose. And again, whenever you see a vector transpose times another vector, that's a dot product. So what we've convinced ourselves is that V dotted with AW is the same as AV dotted with W. I, I find it hard to draw a picture of that formula, but it's a really simple and useful formula, and we're going to see what use of it right now. So now, let's say we have two eigenvectors, and let's say they have eigenvalues alpha and beta, and alpha is not going to equal beta. These are different eigenvectors for different eigenvalues. Okay, so take, so the formula that I have up here is that V dot AW is AV dot W, AW, that's beta W, because it's an eigenvector, and AV, that's alpha V, because it's an eigenvector. So we see that beta times V dot W is the same as alpha times V dot W. In other words, beta minus alpha times V dot W is zero. And if we divide through by beta minus alpha, V dot W is zero. So what we've seen is that these two eigenvectors are going to be orthogonal. So if we have an eigenbasis with n distinct eigenvalues, then they are all going to be orthogonal and we can rescale them to be orthonormal. So what we've said so far is if we have an orthonormal eigenbasis, then the matrix is symmetric. We've said if the matrix is symmetric and has an eigenbasis, then it has an orthonormal eigenbasis. The fact that there is an eigenbasis at all, that's going to be harder. We'll talk about that later after we've also talked about singular value decomposition. But for now, I want to just give you a few other ways to think about this result. So one way is A is symmetric if it only has an orthonormal eigenbasis. Well, what's an eigenbasis mean? It means a basis on which the matrix just acts by dilating the vectors. So here's a picture. Here's a little smiley face. Here's a symmetric matrix. And here is what happens if we multiply the smiley face by the symmetric matrix. And maybe some of you, maybe you'd like, like to actually pause the video and see if you can draw the eigenvectors just from this. So in a moment, I'll show you what the eigenvectors look like. Ready? 
Here they are. Here are the eigenvectors. You can see that they're eigenvectors because this blue vector is mapped to a scalar multiple of itself. See how this blue vector points in the same direction that this one does. And this red vector is also mapped to a scalar multiple of itself. See how this points in the same direction. And you can see that they're orthonormal because, well, they're both length one and they're perpendicular to each other. So uh, these two little vectors forming sort of a mustache for our smiley face on an orthonormal basis. And over here, they got dilated. And that physically is what a symmetric matrix looks like. It's a transformation where there is some orthonormal, some uh, orthonormal basis that gets act that gets rescaled by the matrix like this. Finally, here's one more important way to think about the eigenvectors of a symmetric matrix. The eigenvectors of a symmetric matrix control how much A can dilate a vector by. So if we have some vector W, not an eigenvector, just any vector with length one, which asks how long can AW possibly be? Well, the thing you should do, well, we were given an eigenbasis. In particular, we were given a basis. Whenever you have a basis, you should write right, your given vector W in terms of that basis. So I'm going to write W as a linear combination of my basis. Now, again, this is an orthonormal eigenbasis. So all the geometric formulas we used to work, the condition that W equals one says that the sums of the squares of the CIs is one. That's the Pythagorean theorem. And now let's see how long AW is. Remember to compute the length of a vector, you take a dot product of the vector of itself and take a square root. So AW is C1 lambda 1 C V1 plus blah, 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 CN lambda NVN. We dot that with itself. Uh, I skipped over a few steps, but basically I'm distributing this out. And since I, again, since I have an orthonormal basis, all of the um, geometry works just like we expect and we get C1 squared when, and we just get this squared plus the next term squared all the way up to this squared. So, okay, we have the constraint that the sum of the C's squareds is one. That says that W has length one. And we wanna know how large can this possibly be? Uh, it's not too hard to see. The largest thing to do is to put all of the is to make C1 squared be one and all the others be zero. So we pick up the largest possible coefficient, lambda one. And so the largest possible length of AW is lambda one happening at the V1 eigenvector. And the smallest possible value of AW is lambda n using the, the corresponding eigenvector as well. So, one, so for symmetric matrices, the largest possible value of AW is the largest eigenvector. If, if W has length one. So the largest eigenvector is also the largest stretching of the matrix. And you might wonder what, ha what happens if you don't have a symmetric matrix, what's the largest stretching then? That's gonna lead you to the notion of a singular value decomposition, which is where we're going next. <laughs>